Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mind Matters with Dr. Jada. Today, we're going to dive into the fascinating psychology of fear surrounding the Fonnie Willis case. So just want you to join me as we explore the intricate emotions and reactions that are tied to this legal saga. So remember, click the subscribe button, click the like button, please share with others, and let's first get caught up with everything that's been going on. So Again, I'm going to go through just the bullet points of the case, and then we're going to talk about the psychology implications of how all of this is really unfolding. So first of all, District Attorney Fonnie Willis faces accusations of conflict of interest due to her romantic relationship with fellow prosecutor Nathan Wade. Allegations suggest that Mr. Mr. Wade and uh, Ms. Willis went on vacations together, partly funded by Mr. Wade's earnings from the district attorney's office. Ju Judge McAfee's ruling found an appearance of impropriety, but not enough evidence to support an actual conflict of interest, opting not to disqualify Ms. Willis, but gave her the option of having Mr. Wade step down or having Willis and her entire office step down. What happened? Wade resigned. Then Judge Mac McAfee criticized Miss Willis's conduct, referring to it as a tremendous lapse in judgment and her testimony as unprofessional. The ruling presents setbacks for both Mr. Trump and Miss Willis with potential implications for the election interference case and long-term rep um, reputation damage. And so finally, further legal proceedings including potential, potential appeals and Senate reviews add uncertainty to the case's resolution. And so that's just a very quick, brief update. What I think is important here that we just have to consider is that at the end of the day, every single person involved in this case is a human being. And so there is fear, I'm sure, surrounding all of this for a number of reasons. Number one, on Fonnie Willis's part, she has to be afraid at this particular junction of the case. Because even though she was not disqualified for trying the case, there are other legal implications that have surfaced. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but she did receive um, a letter from Jim Jordan she also has the potential of being, well, a subpoena from Jim Jordan. She also has some other issues that are coming up. Okay, so let's just talk about fear. Every single person who's listening to my voice right now knows what fear is. Fear is a primal emotion that's deeply, deeply rooted in our uh, biology. Why? Because it's designed to keep us safe from potential threats, right? Everybody knows and understands the stress response. So it's like having an internal alarm system alerting us to danger and triggering a cascade of reactions in our body and in our mind. And so when we're talking about the stress response, I like to explain it in this way. In the center of our brain, I like to show my, my students, this is the brain, you open the brain up, and in the center of the brain, there's a little small area, it's called the amygdala. In the amygdala, the amygdala areas where all of our emotions um, and experiences and memories are seared into that area of the brain. So when that area is triggered, the alarm goes off, there's a signal that is sent that says, alert, 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 there is a problem, something needs to happen. Norepinephrine is, is sent to the adrenal glands. Once that happens, cortisol is released into the bloodstream. Um, uh, adrenaline is released and everybody knows that cortisol, that stress hormone is that hormone that causes weight gain as well. But here's what's important about the stress response. We all know that it's the fight, flight, freeze or fawn um, uh, response, but what about when we are in a situation where our ego, our pride, um, our p potential um, way of earning a living is at stake? That's a different type of fear. It is a fear that can grip us at the core of our identity. And I do believe that those who are facing perjury, those who are facing the scrutiny of the public, those who are facing potentially losing their license and their livelihood, um, potentially being disbarred. Um, so there are a lot of issues here. And 
I'd like to just give a couple of examples. Hopefully these are examples that you can relate to because let's just say it's not the case. It's not just the Bonnie Willis case, but let's say that it's a scenario that's happening with you in your office or with you and your family or with you and your relationship, your marriage, whatever it is. It's the same response. It's the same reaction. And so the first example, um, I like to call it the dreaded roller coaster. And just imagine you're standing in line for a roller coaster, the tallest, the fastest one at an amusement park. And as you get closer to the front, your heart races, your palms sweats and butterflies flutter in your stomach. Why? Um, because you're experiencing fear. Now, if you are not necessarily afraid of roller coasters, this doesn't potentially apply to you, but just go with the story. So here's the brain's reaction. When you see the towering structure and you hear the screams of the riders, your brain perceives the roller coaster as a potential threat. Now, listen, the brain is an incredible organ. However, I like to say the brain is also dumb too. Why? Because the brain cannot differentiate between truth or what's real and what's false. We get to tell it what's real and what's not. The brain is going to automatically assume that there's a threat. So it activates the amygdala, the fear center of the brain, which again, sends the signal to the hypothalamus and releases stress hormones, like I said earlier, like the adrenaline and the cortisol. Now, the physical response these hormones kick your body into high gear, increasing your heart rate, of course, dilating pupils and diverting blood flow to your muscles so that you can get ready for action. Your body is preparing for action, whether it's fighting, fleeing, or in the case of this example, riding the roller coaster. So that's the physical response. The cognitive impact, remember, fear also affects our thinking. So Oftentimes, in scenarios where that alarm is tripwired or it, the switch is turned on, we may start engaging in worst case scenarios. What if the roller coaster derails? What if this will be the very time that it breaks down? And what if um, you pass out because you're so afraid? And, you know, all of these thoughts heighten anxiety, making the experience even more intense. And so, that's the cognitive response. The behavioral response, despite the fear that you're undergoing, you decide to get on the roller coaster anyway. Why? Because fear equals excitement and a cocktail of emotions that keeps you coming back for more. So that's the roller coaster experience. Now, listen, that's a roller coaster. What about the scenario that we are seeing play out right before our eyes? We've seen, we've seen erratic behaviors. We've seen um, perceived lies. Um, we've seen what we may have uh, defined as deception. What makes a person do all of these things? And again, I'm not targeting anyone specifically. Bonnie Lewis, what? many have said she's perjured herself. Nathan Wade, he's not telling the truth. He's perjured himself. Terrence Bradley, he's not telling the truth. It doesn't appear that he's being forthright with the information. So here we have three attorneys who have taken the stand and potentially or allegedly lied and perjured themselves. What makes a person do that? Fear. So the question is, what are they afraid of? What makes a person not tell the truth? What makes a person um, behave? You know, I, I watched um, Fonnie Willis again. I, I watched when she walked into the courtroom. I watched as she stood there waiting to take the stand. I watched her as she took the stand and she was sworn in. I watched her body language and her disposition. I watched her eye movement. I watched the way she moved in the chair. All of those things did not signal to me that that was a person in control. That was a person afraid. That was a person in extreme fear. Why? Because when a person takes in information and data 
processes that information and data, flips it around, and then turns it back and sends it out in an aggressive manner the way that she did toward Ashley Merchant, that is not a person, again, who is in control of the moment. Now, I know, I know there were a lot of you who saying she had a right to respond that way. She had a right to um, stand up for herself. She had a right to show that she was angry. She had a right, believe me, I've heard it. I've heard it in my comments. Um, I've heard all the things. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about a professional approach to how we address things, Usually when we are in control and we're able to process using executive functioning and not operating out of an emotional reaction or re emotional response to the data that has been given to us, then we're able to communicate in an effective way. The communicative process, it works for you, not against you. What happened with Fani, that wasn't working for her. And I even said it in one of my other videos. I said, Fani, stop talking. Literally, just stop talking. But she couldn't. She was on autopilot. And fear drove her to attempt to control the narrative. And it did not work. Now, of course, many people are celebrating and you know, saying that she won because she didn't get disqualified from the Trump case. But to me, that wasn't a win. That was not a win. Why? Because first of all, she's damaged her credibility. And now everyone is looking at her as someone who is not only incompetent, but is someone who is not trustworthy. And so fear the psychological implications of how fear causes us to not be able to engage in our um, executive functioning skills to be able to make a decision, a healthy decision. All of these areas that we've seen play out on this stage was in direct relationship to fear. Let's break this down. If Fannie Willis were caught in the act of perjury, mishandling federal funds, or breaking the code of ethics in some way, she would likely experience what I believe to be profound fear and anxiety due to the potential consequences and fallout from her actions. So let's, let's look at this. Number one, perjury. So the legal ramifications um, for perjury or lying under oath is a serious offense that can of course, result in criminal charges and potential imprisonment. The district attorney may fear facing prosecution, trial, and the possibility of a very lengthy prison sentence if found guilty. Now, the her professional reputation will be at, could be at stake because being caught lying under oath can be irreparably damaging to her professional reputation and credibility. Um, and of course, we have to look at the loss of her job, being disbarred and facing public shame and humiliation. Um, I worked with a client not too long ago who um, the case was just absolutely um, unbearable for her. But again, when we're looking at just the humiliation that goes along with losing your career, losing a part of your identity. Because remember, our professional identity is very much a part of who we are. So again, um, you know, if Fani loses, and she's lost much of her professional reputation, I believe already. Um, she's scraping the bottom, I think, of the barrel to hold on to the professional identity that um, she has, but it's been so um, tainted that coming back from this is going to be, I, I think, very difficult. Um, let's look at mishandling uh, federal funds. Um, the legal consequences, of course, of mishandling federal funds is an offense that can lead to, of course, criminal charges, um, hefty fines, and even, again, imprisonment. Um, so the fear that comes up for her right now may be the prosecution by federal authorities and even the severe penalties that could follow that. And what are the career implications to this? 
you know, misappropriating funds can result, of course, in even the termination of her position as district attorney, her district attorney. Um, again, we've already talked about the career um, implications of this, but losing your livelihood, losing your livelihood and facing difficulties, finding employment in the future. So all of these, I believe that in a person's quiet time, in their darkest moments of processing this information from an emotional and psychological perspective, I can't even begin to think what Fani might be experiencing right now, but I do know that only a person who is disconnected from reality, only a person who chooses to think otherwise, she has to. I don't think that she's so disconnected from reality that she is not considering the possibility of having to face these consequences. And so, you know, being caught in the act of perjury, mishandling federal funds and breaking the code of ethics would of course likely, um, a person would likely experience intense fear due to the potential legal, professional, and personal repercussions of their actions. And they would experience the prospect of criminal charges, loss of reputation, career devastation, and social alienation. So the fear facing these consequences may pro prompt a person to seek the legal counsel. And hopefully, um, you know, again, my, my goal is to just look at all things uh, psychological, uh, look at it from a therapeutic perspective, a clinical perspective, what could be going on, what might be happening with her, um, again, sending prayers uh, her way. But at the end of the day, um, I think all of us in some way have to face the consequences of our actions. It's just unfortunate for Fani that hers is playing out on a public stage. So if you like this content, I'm going to ask you to hit the subscribe button so you can stay connected. Join our community because we're talking all things psychology and emotional management. Um, and we want to um, advocate for healthy mental well-being. So hit the like button, hit that subscribe button. Stay with us and I'll see you in the next video.